Please welcome Dr. Michael Ramsey. This next panel, panel number two, is termed using real-time data from electronic medical records. And this really is one of the exciting panels that we've got um, because it's really about AI and looking into electronic records. You know, To Err is Human um, was published uh, in 1998 and it was talking about 44 to 98,000 preventable deaths in healthcare. Then Macquarie came out in 2015 from Johns Hopkins and said, no, the number's much nearer 250,000. Now we've got tools with AI to mine electronic medical records and uh, get the real data and maybe convert what's considered unpreventable harm to preventable. In other words, get early warnings when patients are getting into trouble. So I think this, this panel has a, a great option of showing us the future. So with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. Um, if you'd please come up. Please welcome Philip Lum, Mark Conrad, David Stuckwell, Barbara Fain, Drew Ladner, and Ruth Andrew. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philip Lum. I'm uh, an emeritus professor and former chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology at the Keck University School of Medicine, University of Southern California. I am deeply honored today to be joined by a distinguished panel uh, who I'd like to introduce, and then I'd like to also discuss a little bit about what we're going to try and accomplish. I'm going to start with Ruth Ann Darrell. She is an Assistant Inspector General for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of the Inspector General, the OIG. She has co-led the OIG's patient safety work for 17 years, including its research to determine national incidence rates of adverse events in hospitals and nursing homes. Ruth Ann leads the OIG's National Initiative for Improving Nursing Homes and is a senior fellow with the Partnership for Public Health Services in Washington, D.C., Ruth Ann Darrell. Next is Barbara Fain. She serves as the executive director of the Betsy Lehman Center for Patient Safety, a unique organization. It's the only Massachusetts state government agency uh, named after a person. Barbara, uh, she, in fact, uh, Betsy Lehman was a nationally recognized Boston Globe healthcare reporter whose death from a massive overdose of chemotherapy during treatment for breast cancer ignited the patient safety movement almost 30 years ago. A gr uh, an unfortunate but powerful patient story. The center is now leading, a, leading an effort to implement the state's new roadmap to healthcare safety, which is a statewide strategic initiative that has engaged a consortium of Massachusetts providers, patients, payers, and policymakers to overcome known barriers to sustained improvement in safety outcomes. One of its foundational action steps is a pilot of automated adverse event monitoring in diverse Massachusetts hospitals. David Stockwell is, an, is active in the field of patient safety in many areas. He is the chief medical officer at Johns Hopkins Children's Center in Baltimore, Maryland, where he oversees and guides the operations of safety and quality. He is also the chief clinical officer at Pascal Metrics, a federally certified patient safety organization. He is also an active patient safety researcher where his work has largely been focused on identifying patient safety events and consistent classification of those events. Mark Conrad is head of medical and clinical at Phillips Hospitals patient monitoring, and with that, he's responsible for medical safety and clinical strategy, but he's also being involved in innovation and clinical partnerships. He is a trained anesthesiologist and intensivist with ex extensive experience in human factor training while he was working clinically full time. After moving to industry, uh, his area of interest has been multi-parameter monitoring and device interoperability. 
He holds several patent patents in acute care device and measurement combination. Finally, uh, and certainly not lastly, Drew Ladner is the chairman and CEO of Pascal Metrics, a patient safety and risk data analytics company. Well before the conventional wisdom changed, Pascal operationalized at scale evidence-based adverse event definition from peer review published and real world evidence. And this is required to measure, manage, and reduce patient harm and related costs, as well as to apply AI in this new integrated domain of safety and risk. Prior to founding Pascal, Drew worked across software, telecom, and media industries. He also served in government as CIO of the U.S. Treasury and in economic development, launching a microenterprise micro bank in East Africa. In addition, he was a member of the Markle Foundation 9-11 Commission Task Force and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. I believe you will agree with me that this is a panel that is uniquely qualified to discuss how we use real-time data from electronic medical records. I'm old enough to have begun in the era of pencil and paper and illegible handwriting, uh, suffered through the beginnings of the electronic, I won't call it a medical record, I will call it the electronic billing record that was the first <laughs> definition of why we went into EHRs, and have watched the evolution of the EMR from its early stages when it was abhorred by physicians to one that was tolerated by physicians and hopefully to a future where it will aid nurses, pharmacists, physicians, and all members of the healthcare team into the future of ensuring patient safety, early warning of patient deterioration, and the reduction in patient harms. The sequence uh, will begin on the following order. Ruth Ann will discuss the global problems with examples from the OIG and the report that the, and the insight she has gained from those reports. Barbara will continue with a current state-of-the-art utilization of information based on her, her experiences with the Betsy Lehman Center in Massachusetts. Uh, David will follow with a discussion of the current status of EMRs and the ability to create a searchable, relevant database, uh, data pool and registry. Mark will reflect on the contrast between real-time and real-time now versus real-time statistical uh, analysis and also multiple applications of the cross-platform integration of data and Drew, as the cleanup hitter, will talk about the future of AI, its opportunities, its threats, and the way in which it needs to be controlled. So I think with that, uh, each of our panelists is going to present a brief discussion. We're going to try and keep on time. I have some pointed questions for the panel at the end of their presentations. And I urge any of you who may have questions uh, from the audience to please let, let us know. I've been given a special iPad here that somehow, if I remember what the passcode is, uh, at the end of all of this, it will be unlocked and your questions will be revealed. So we are, we are, we are set to go and I'm going to start with uh, Ruth Ann. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lum. Um, we are so grateful uh, from the OIG to be able to speak with you today. I send um, greetings from the Inspector General who herself early in her career was on our adverse events uh, team and um, have many team members here with me today and I want to give a couple of shout outs to them but just know that it's 
deeply important to our organization. And my role today is just to um, establish from the work that we've done that harm persists and that detection is indeed difficult, to talk about some of the methods that we've used to try to identify adverse events over the years. Um, those of you who may not be as familiar with the Inspector General's Office, um, we fight fraud, waste, and abuse in federal health care programs. We have um, agents and auditors who uh, look for fraudulent billing and go after providers who are providing poor, in some cases, terrible care. And then our particular shop evaluates the effectiveness of programs. We were given many years ago at this point a specific mandate from Congress to identify an incidence rate of adverse events. We first uh, tackled this and didn't really know how to approach it. We spent a few months at the beginning of our inquiry, we're now 20 studies in all these years later, um, talking with all the heavyweights in the field. And I still go back to those interviews um, all the time. I was just talking with uh, Drew about them. We were able to speak with Lucian, uh, Lucian Leap, um, Bob Wachter, it's how I met Dr. Berwick, um, Sue Sheridan, uh, David Gaba, Jeffrey Cooper, all of the people who were at the, the advent of adverse events detection. And then we've basically thrown the kitchen sink at this, trying to find any way that we can to try to, de to detect harm so that we can um, correct problems as they exist and know and understand that harm more effectively. Um, so just to, to talk in a little bit more detail about what we do, and then my colleague Amy Ashcraft is actually speaking tomorrow at 1.30 about our methods uh, more specifically. But um, we, we define harm as all-cause harm. Anything that is in the provision of healthcare, harm that occurred that was not the result of underlying disease, whether omission or commission. One of the things we feel most strongly about is that a wide range of harm occurs. And so in determining how we might look at that, we tried everything. We went to hospitals all over the country. Um, we even interviewed patients and families. We went to claims analysis. We looked at um, PSIs. We tried to figure out present on admission. We um, looked at incident reporting systems, obviously, all kinds of hospital surveillance systems, and nothing um, worked for us in terms of predicting that a harm might occur better than uh, trigger methodology. And so that's what we based our work on over the years. Only at the beginning, we use uh, the IHI's global trigger tool to screen for events in medical records. Because we're a law enforcement organization, um, we have access, that's where we focused our attention is on medical record review because we can access them. Unlike a lot of researchers, if a facility takes Medicare or Medicaid dollars, which is virtually everyone, then we have access to their records. So that's our sweet spot. So we've developed this extensive medical record review that starts with the global trigger tool, involves expert physician review, including Dr. Stockwell, um, a physician panel to reach consensus that harm occurred, and then a lot of deep dives about harm types, severity levels, um, uh, preventability, and cost. And we actually have here in the room, Dimitri Martinez, one of my colleagues, um, was an author of a series of toolkits that we have for free online for those of you who may be more uh, interested in our methods that, that take you to a very specific level. But what we found is the same thing I was told by the 70 experts I talked to 15 plus years ago. Harm persists, it's difficult to detect, and hospitals themselves, and we've gone into nursing homes, we've gone into inpatient rehab, long-term care hospitals, lots of other facility types, aren't identifying that harm occurs because we're not using the same definitions or nomenclature to be able to identify it. So we have these core foundational barriers that are still true today, lack of identification of harm because people aren't completely clear on what harm is. Um, they use terms like um, known complications or expected side effects as opposed to harm. So in our work over the years, we found incidence rates, depending on the setting, of anywhere from 13% of the population um, experiencing harm events up to 46%. And our most recent study, so half, um, we found that 25% of hospitalized Medicare beneficiaries experienced harm during their stays. And of course, this doesn't just take um, 
you know, terrible human toll, but it also takes an, a, has an opportunity cost because all the money that we're spending for extended lengths of stay or what have you as a result of the harm event is money that's not being spent on improvement and innovation. So I want to hand it over to the experts in this new enterprise to look at adverse events in real time. We in the IG's office have not studied it yet. We um, plan to, but it poses um, a new idea for how we can um, you know, marshal, leverage our enormous data sets uh, and medical records in order to find harm in real time in a way that none of the methods the IG has spent 17 years looking at have been successful in doing. Um, thank you, Dr. Lim. Okay, so um, so what I'd like to do is just briefly share um, a state level perspective uh, on all of this and also tee up uh, sort of the topic of this panel of why um, why we really need to begin to supplement the data resources we have, which and have largely been administrative uh, data with uh, with something different and um, and then also in the promise of automating adverse event detection through uh, electronic health records. So just quickly, in a nutshell, um, Dr. Lum referred to the Massachusetts uh, roadmap to, to healthcare safety. Um, it very, has very strong parallels with the action, National Action Plan. It's a very action-oriented uh, strategic plan. Um, but where it, um, where it departs a bit is in elevating measurement and transparency into one of those sort of the high-level domains. Um, in addition to leadership and governance and patient family engagement and supporting the healthcare workforce. But the reason uh, we, we elected to do that is that um, to accomplish any of those other goals, uh, we really need uh, better data than we currently have. Um, I'm going to give you kind of a real uh, world experience um, from uh, the Betsy Lehman Center's uh, work where a non-regulatory uh, state agency, we work closely with our health department and, uh, and other s stakeholders. Uh, but one of our, uh, one of our uh, initiatives over the past couple of years, uh, in collaboration with our, our Department of Public Health, uh, is, uh, is around a serious uh, maternal morbidity. So we uh, take the hospital discharge data that the state receives uh, from, uh, from all hospitals, it's mandated reporting, and every month um, we, um, do, we analyze that data and uh, prepare a highly individualized um, report for each of the, birth, the state's birthing hospitals, um, showing them, showing their metrics, uh, uh, where, uh, you know, what, what's happening in terms of uh, serious maternal morbidity. And, you know, I would like to say um, that, um, that this has been a resounding success, but it hasn't been. The idea is really it's a traditional uh, quality safety improvement uh, model where they get the data, the idea is that they engage with it, we provide, we offer technical assistance, coaching, learning collaboratives to help them focus on the areas where the data points to, uh, to weaknesses. But um, unfortunately, the engagement uh, hasn't been what, uh, what we'd hoped for, and the conversations tend to begin and end with, um, with skepticism about the validity of the data. So it normally starts, I mean, it's, it's like we can predict this at this point. It starts with your analysis must be wrong. Um, we sit down, we show them why it's not wrong. The next thing is, well, okay, you're right about that, but um, so it must have been our mistake in the way we coded the data because no one here remembers anything like that happening. Besides, your data are old. They're, they're several months out of date because with administrative data, it just takes, there's that lag time. It's this inevitable, we've accelerated as, as much as we possibly can, but it's not fresh. It's not about what happened to your current patients or even the patients the previous week. It's, it's, months, uh, it's months old. And then the other, it's you know, these codes, they're not, there's no clinical significance. These represent isolated incidents. Um, really nothing to, nothing to see or do here, so no action 
uh, no action necessary. And that's obviously that's 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 a problem. And uh, and you know, frankly, the data the data are better than than that. I would say, um, but they are. Um, but the but the hospitals do have um, do have a point. There are, there are real gaps. It doesn't really tell the story, the why behind these events. Um, it's not these. What they're seeing is not recognizable. And you know, and I think that the um, the sense that um, that they are doing that you know these things may be happening elsewhere, but they have a pretty good grasp of what's going on under their own feet, and they're comfortable with their performance. I mean, it really um, is reinforced by um, by gaps in sort of the lag in administrative data, the gaps that we have through the uh, through the reporting systems, through the manual voluntary reporting systems, which create this almost this this illusion that um, that you know things are pretty good, um, we're doing as well as we can, and that leads to that um, sort of resistance to engaging. And the complacency and and the rest of it. So, um, so we've you know really um, what we've concluded uh, through this process in developing the roadmap is that we need to begin to leverage um, the, uh, the this technology enabled approach to really turn to um, to turn to the clinical um, records and and uh, because that's that's going to be the more meaningful uh, that's going to be the more meaningful data. Um, so we are um, uh, one of the uh, key action steps of the roadmap is a pilot of um, an auto automated adverse uh, event uh, monitoring system in six to eight diverse Massachusetts hospitals. Um, I am going to let uh, uh, David uh, explain what, how these systems work, what this, what this does, but it basically provides real-time clinically validated information back to uh, back to hospitals that um, that um, and what we're going to be doing through through the pilot is evaluating not only uh, how much you know how many events uh, are these are these systems detecting but what what is you know what's happening in terms of how is that having that information leading to um, improvement leading to a reduction in harm how is it saving not only saving lives but saving money which everyone wants to know about where's that return on investment um, we're also looking at uh, the impact on the healthcare workforce. Is this, is this, can this be possibly be supportive of the workforce in terms of reducing, not eliminating, but reducing their reporting burden and helping them focus um, on the improvement, uh, uh, focus their improvement work on the things that really matter most. Um, and then there's, you know, from a from a health equity standpoint, you know, one one of the things these systems do is they eliminate the human bias that we know results in vast underreporting of adverse events um, that happen to certain uh, populations based on race, age, other other characteristics. So um, so we believe that there's um, there's there's a lot of um, of potential here. And uh, we already know from um, just anecdotally from our conversations with what we call some of the early adopters of this technology that they are um, showing uh, really uh, dramatic and sustained reductions in harm, which is the you know which is really the whole point of this. This is not a counting exercise. This is if that's all it were, we wouldn't make, be looking to make this investment. Um, but it's really what we're really trying to do here is use this information to to actually uh, to actually reduce harm. And uh, and so uh, so that's uh, and the other thing we will be doing is publishing because another interesting aspect of the early, some of the early adopters is that there's been a reluctance to uh, even acknowledge that these systems are in use, um, concern about uh, even though they have great success stories to share, concern about reputational costs of of uh, acknowledging that harm is happening in in their institutions, and uh, which I think goes back to the the whole safety culture uh, issue. So anyway, with that, shall we just pass it, pass it on down? So um, what, a, what a great segue. The, the, we heard a lot in the panel before that what is measured gets managed. What I've just heard from the previous two excellent panelists is that as of today, there is a way to measure it, but hospitals aren't doing it. And so is it any surprise that our patient safety outcomes are floundering, they're struggling, we're not getting better. 
Well, maybe because we're not measuring them accurately. We know through much of Ruth Ann's team's work, excellent work, that there are so many harm events that are not captured. And um, I'm a practicing physician, I'm a pediatric intensivist. We all need the ability to complete a voluntary event report, whatever you call that in your organization. That, is, that will always be the case. We always need to be able to raise our hand and say something bad happened here and we can't let that happen today. But that can't be our sole source of safety knowledge. It's got to be augmented with a much more intentional approach, like the one that the OIG has, has embarked upon and, and I was privileged to be a part of. Um, so before I, I go any further, I wanna ask another question related to that. It's a, it's a thought question. Please feel free to talk amongst yourselves if you'd like to. Um, but for your organization, for your hospital, for your country, if you're from outside the United States, what is the number one preventable high harm event in your hospital organization country? In the United States, we can't answer that today. I can't. And if you have an answer for that, we could argue about it, but I guess that's the point. It's not clear. We know, we heard earlier, that cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death. But we don't know what the number one cause of preventable deaths are in the United States today. And it's because we don't manage it. We don't measure it well. And therefore, how can we expect to manage it well? So um, uh, uh, stepping off the soapbox for a little bit, how do you do that? How can you do that in a more consistent way? Well, the, the, the EHR is affords us the ability to leverage more consistent measurement strategies, building exactly on what we heard about from the, the OIG work. Take hints, clues that, that exist in the medical record for every inpatient, every emergency room patient. It can exist for every outpatient, but for now the work has largely been done in the inpatient and the emergency room environments. And look for those clues. And right now, the way that that happens is to stream over that electronic health record data into a PSO protected cloud, and then have patient safety experts, nurses, pharmacists, who know their stuff, who know how to classify, and who know what a patient safety event is with consistent definitions. It's critically important. It's another reason we haven't gotten very far um, is because there's so many different definitions out there. And they can apply those consistent definitions to these patient safety events. And when these patient safety events are identified, they can classify them in terms of type, severity, and preventability. And then you can answer a question that in my hospital today I can't answer, which is, are we safer today than we were six months ago? Are we safer today than we were a year ago? You can't do that with voluntary event reporting. Um, but you can if you measure things consistently over time and, and, and capture those events. And like Barbara said, this is not a counting exercise. It's just the first step. It's a critical step to be able to understand what is the scope of our patient safety issues. And the beautiful thing about these relying on the electronic health record is that this data is churning all the time. And it is, it is giving you the ability to assess the, the, the effectiveness of any of your interventions for any specific event type. Um, so there are, are so many opportunities to benefit from consistent measurement of, of safety events and the electronic health record affords us that. The last piece that, that I'll say is that um, uh, AI will be a part of that. It is rather laborious, and I know several individuals in the room who have tried to, to do their own manual trigger approach and said that, you know what, it was just so much work we couldn't keep up. AI is gonna help in that regard. Um, it may not, it probably won't replace that patient safety expert, but it'll probably turn them away from being an investigator into being a quality assurance um, uh, uh, person so that they can ensure that the data that is, that is generated is accurate, is actionable, and is worthy of archiving and using in the next round of uh, patient safety activities. So there's a lot that the electronic health record can let us do, um, but 
first we've got to consistently measure it and manage it and understand what those patient safety events are. Off to you, sir. Thank you very much. It's also uh, a great segue uh, from sort of monitoring events and stuff to then in a population to move it to maybe an individual. What can we do for the individual? And it's a bit of a funny topic to talk about real-time data versus real-time data. But it's, it's what, what you said, what we lack is a proper definition. How do we define real-time? What is the sampling rate? How quickly uh, do we get the data synchronized to the systems and what is it synchronized to? And how do we visualize it to the caregivers? And I think that's, that's a problem and that's uh, a little bit what I want to talk about. So uh, just, just think about an EMR and the use cases and the needs behind it. We've already heard it's, it's been deployed as a financial tool, as a controlling tool, not so much as a clinical and clinical decision support tool, but that's what we use it for. But now let's think what, what EMRs can do. Sampling rates usually are defined by, by the samples. So if it's lab data, it's maybe once a day, once a week, might be several times a day. Vital sign data might come in more frequently, four times, sometimes continuously, if you have SPO2, ECG, et cetera, it comes in continuously, but the sampling rate rarely exceeds one per minute. So that leaves you with very specific use cases, and I'll get to that in a second. If you think therapeutic or monitoring devices, we talk about sampling rates of 400, 500 hertz. So that's 500 data points per second. So you can't deal with that visualized as numbers. So what we get is waveforms. It looks different and it gives you a very different perspective uh, on what that data is, on the acuity of the data and how you can use and leverage that. If I think and try to, to put that into a focus of patient safety, um, I like to, to take three different perspectives on looking at this. And one could be disease centric or event centric. Why do we want to look at this data? And that's what you've elaborated to. We want to predict deterioration. We want to calculate risk for an individual. And I think we can very well do that today with the systems that we have, like you've mentioned, but now adding high fidelity, high sampling rate data, my guess is unproven, but my guess would be that we might be more accurate and maybe even more timely. But the, the disease and event-centric is only one piece of the puzzle. If we think the second one being staff-centric or the third one being patient-centric, I think that's where it really comes together because what does staff need? And we've got this example from Lewis uh, earlier in, uh, in, in the day. Alarm fatigue has been identified as a significant cause of harm for a long time. And what we hear is the patient was monitored, Lewis was monitored, and the alarm was going off all the time, but it was just silenced. No action triggered out of this alarm. So how can we serve the needs of the nurses? And there is one huge need, which is situational awareness, which is human factor engineered device interfaces and engagement and design. I'm not gonna talk about this. Uh, my friend and colleague, Peter, will talk later in the session about exactly this topic but it's really about sort of offloading the burden of the caregivers. Roughly in high acuity, you have you know, 400 to 550 alarms per patient per day. This burden is so incredibly big that people simply turn off the alarms and don't take them seriously. Things like that happen. Plus, what about Lewis and the mom? They're concerned with every alarm that's going off. Nobody comes, there's no action. Is it safe, is it not safe? We're not sure. Do we expect patients to turn off the alarms because nobody's coming? We're not sure. Hope not. I hope not either, but uh, we've done, we've done uh, this year at HIMSS uh, under the leadership of Philips and with uh, a lot of big industry players, we've tried to do an alarm workflow and we've, we've did a feasibility and an implementation of alarm workflow with bedside monitoring, syringe drivers, ventilators, incubators for neonates, and we've created an, a technology that removes all alarms from the patient room. 
safely. So the patient can sleep as an intact sleep-wake rhythm, probably with positive impact uh, on delirium, incidence of delirium, certainly with a positive impact on stress, because you know, not being woken up in the middle of the night because of a misplaced sensor. We've decreased the burden to the nurses because suddenly the nurses don't get the 480 of each patient, which is visible, soundable in the general, in the ward. They only get the ones remotely distributed to their phone of their patients, so the burden rapidly decreases. So that was shown. So I, I really think that um, technology has a, a, a huge step. We're just at the front of creating sort of that step from going from data to information. Um, and also on, on Lewis' story, just imagine the real-time high fidelity and the real-time low fidelity would go hand in hand. I mean, every clinician in the room, this heart-wrenching story, Ketorolac is known to cause gastric ulcers. What about a system that doesn't give you an alarm on the pulse ox, the pulse rate is high? What about a system that correlates a pulse rate that increases with a PLEF signal that decreases with a medication chart that says Ketorolac can cause bleeding? Your patient is showing all physical signs of a potential bleed. Go have a look. So I think if we look at this uh, real, real-time high fidelity and the low fidelity real-time, if that really comes together, going hand in hand, that could be a win-win-win situation for industry, patients, and caregivers. Thank you. Our cleanup hitter. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> well, let me start by pointing out a fascinating development in the AI industry at large. Um, away from patient safety, but we'll come back to patient safety. A little over a month ago, a small company called Hayes Labs uh, received investment, a uh, new company, uh, and it received a valuation of $100 million. And if you're not in business, that's, that's, that's pretty high. Um, two days ago, a company called Safe Superintelligence uh, received an investment of a billion dollars of cash in at a $5 billion uh, valuation. Now, what is the mission of both of these companies? It's about safe AI. And I think as a lot of us know, um, you know, what followed that heady realization when we downloaded ChatGPT about 20 months ago and started asking it questions, it's extraordinary what it would tell us. But what we also found out, it would tell us a lot of other things too. It began to hallucinate. And so what's interesting is that the teams, you know, the smartest folks in the industry, the investors, the elite investors that are backing them, and make no mistake, these groups are really driving where the AI industry uh, is going, recognize that if we don't trust AI, there will be no value. And so, uh, what they are doing is trying to ensure that, yes, they've scraped all the contents of the internet, but just throwing everything into an AI model is likely going to have less satisfying results on the output side as well. Garbage in, garbage out. That's now conventional wisdom. Therein lies, I think, why I think what my colleagues have been sharing is so important. I mean, what Ruthann what the OIG has shown in two landmark reports is that there is a way to generate clinically validated adverse event outcomes with clinical data. The Bates et al. piece, which some of us are familiar with, that was published last year, 11 Harvard Hustle Study in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, also used that same underlying methodology of effectively trigger-based adverse event detection. Um, and these clinically validated adverse event outcomes using real-time EHR and health IT data, uh, I think are optimal, if not essential, based on what the evidence is indicating for defining adverse events with common definitions. That's what we need to train adver uh, AI models with, machine learning models. We can't use event reporting data for the reasons described. Um, and I think Dr. Berwick, in an editorial accompanying 
the Bates et al. piece said that, quote, voluntary reporting is so unreliable as to be nearly worthless in the calcu calculation of rates, unquote. And so if we together in the field are seeking to move to high reliability, are seeking to move to zero harm, but as David said, we're not measuring, um, it's not enough, necessary but not sufficient. And we can't find these validated outcomes data in even billion dollar HIM stage seven epic implementations, doesn't exist. So we need these data, we need to kind of lean into this. Why on the AI side? Number one, we need, as I just intimated, we need to train AI models with the appropriate outcomes. If one talks to data scientists outside of healthcare, certainly outside of patient safety, it seems honestly preposterous to them that we'd expect to be able to predict with, with high accuracy adverse events if we're using all kinds of proxy outcomes data. We need to use the real outcomes data uh, to, to predict. Um, and you know, in so doing, we're actually predicting outcomes. We're not predicting deterioration. We can predict outcomes, which is materially better. Second, back to safe AI. If we really want to know if AI is safe, we need the safety outcomes measurement to know what was safety prior to the AI-related intervention and what was safety after. If we don't have the outcomes data, we will be throwing all kinds of algorithms at EHR data and involved in a lot of things which actually are inefficient. And that will have the impact of not really moving the field along as quickly and as, as well as possible. The third piece is what health systems um, with which my organization has been working have found, have validated that when we measure adverse events, it's not just beneficial for safety, patient safety. It's beneficial for really calculating risk while the patient's in the hospital versus waiting until it's really more of a case management situation well after uh, months later. Uh, and, and based on where CMS is going, um, there's gonna be value on the reimbursement side too. So if we get AI wrong with respect to adverse events, it's gonna have enterprise impact which will be more significant, I think, as we move forward, both clinically and financially. Um, last quick, quick um, aside, one of, our, um, one of the people that I work with, senior um, clinician at a major health system, just last week, she said, AI is not coming tomorrow, it's here, it's here. And so the question I think for our field is, are we going to continue to avoid really using outcomes to train these models and really have, I think, you know, a, a lot of energy and time uh, wasted and more injury and death happen? Or are we gonna to come together and really use outcomes to develop models to move patient safety forward much further, much faster? Thank you. And I'd just like to thank all of the panel members uh, for excellent, uh, comments and provocative discussions. I think I'll just try and summarize a few of the things um, that I, I, I learned from this. What is a patient safety event? Do we have consistency in monitoring them? Is it following consistently and ultimately improving so that we can finally get to zero harm. Quality improvement data needs to be action, accurate, actionable, and worthy or accurate enough for storage. We need to move from population-based to hospital-based to individual performance data so that we can make it real to all members of the healthcare team. In other words, we need to visualize to the various caregivers the information that we're tracking from artificial intelligence. We heard that the withdrawal of noise is important. We're trying to create for medicine the glass cockpit that they have in the aviation industry. I was very impressed with high-tech and low-tech collaboration. That 
is the best way I've ever heard described that it's not cookbook medicine. The clinician by the bedside, the critical care nurse, the floor nurse, the janitorial staff when they're engaged can all be crucial in helping patient safety in our organization. And finally, we need to train AI, not allow it to train us. And that means that unlike ChatGPT, which is reviewing the world of non-peer-reviewed information and coming up occasionally with hallucinatory garbage, we need to ensure that the things that go into the AI models are curated and clinically valid so that we can act on them. We are unfortunately running out of time, so I'm going to, if the panel will excuse me, I have, uh, with this splendid device, some, uh, if I can make it work. Oh, I entered one, two, three, four, okay. Ah, yes, I have a few questions. And uh, I think that uh, this may go to, um, to Ruth Ann. In terms of using the EMR for detection of harm, how will we manage false positives and is there a need for human verification processes? Yeah, others on the panel, I'd love to add to that. But um, yeah, that's always been my assumption that you have to marry both of those. That um, certainly once the training gets more and more sophisticated, you get closer and closer. But I love, like you said, the notion of merging high tech with low tech. I can't imagine that we could have an effective system that would cut out that human discernment uh, in, entirely. Then I will follow up with one of uh, perhaps uh, Mark here. Um, in terms of using the EMR de for detection of harm, uh, sorry, what? Uh, uh, at the bedside, how do we balance the reliance on AI and clin clinician intuition? in our practice? I think that the, the AI models, um, and that's what, when you talk to experts, what, wherever you look, and there is areas where AI is actively deployed in imaging, in gastroscopies, and in, 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 in ultrasound, and in, in sort of image detection. I think what, what generally we see is um, the average will improve. The expert will win. So if you have junior staff in the middle of the night, you might want to trust the AI and maybe call the expert. Uh, if you are the expert at the bedside with you know, 20 plus years of clinical experience, you may want to ignore the AI or take it into consideration, but clearly make your decision based on your own observations that sometimes go beyond what the AI was trained with. Thank you. Um, Perhaps, uh, Barbara, what policy, oversight, and payment incentives need to change in Massachusetts to make safety investment in things like data a more actionable priority? Wow. Um, <laughs> Thank you, audience. Whoever, yeah. Whoever. <laughs> That's a big question, uh, a question for, for an entire panel. Um, you know, I think one of the things, uh, another aspect of this this roadmap process that we've um, that we've gone through is recognizing that um, that this that the obligations, the work that needs to be done around improvement, can't all be happen within the walls of provider organizations, uh, because we're really talking about the entire continuum of care. Um, and we're talking about um, really what is what what's the role of, um, of of policymakers? What's the role of payers? There's this whole this much larger ecosystem that needs to be engaged um, that needs to be engaged in this. 
Um, you know, we are, um, you know, I think everyone has struggled um, it, 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 in every state and at the federal level at uh, getting uh, the investment in, in safety. And part of the reason, it's the same reason that there's, it's, it's difficult to get that prioritization to happen uh, at the hospital level or other pro provider organization level. It's just not um, necessarily recognized safety. You know, that, that what I hear all the time in my conversations uh, with legislators and others is look, you know, we've got a lot of problems. Like healthcare is in a crisis. Um, you know, we've got basically bigger fish to fry. This is, you know, this isn't um, this isn't a, a compelling um, uh, issue. There isn't, despite many of you in this room who I know are um, like really effective uh, patient family advocates around this issue. Um, the the policymakers aren't feeling this grassroots um, push around this issue, and so they're looking elsewhere. But that's part of the reason we need better information, uh, because if the information we have is dismissed or dismissible, then then we're stuck. Um, so this is um, so so this information. You know, people have different informational needs. Providers need information they can use to react to things happening to their patients as they're happening, and then uh, but policymakers need to understand understand kind of the big picture and to understand that this is um, that this is an issue that it's like it should be enough to say like we need to like save say this is about saving lives um, but I need to see how it's having an impact on the rest of the healthcare system and the things that they think are the priority um, in the healthcare system around cost, around um, uh, around access, around everything. It's all tied together and safety, you know, I like to think of like safety as a potential gateway to improving all of those other things. So we're not gonna do, we're not gonna improve the healthcare system unless we start with safety. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to break things up here. I'd just like to thank our panelists. I suggest uh, there are some excellent questions here. Please buttonhole the panelists. I'm sure they would be delighted uh, to answer your questions. And uh, just remember when the lunar lander landed on the moon, uh, lo, these many years ago, they had the best navigational systems available at the time, but Armstrong still had to bring it in by stick and control because the AI at the time, as he stated, it's taking me into a field that's full of rocks. So <laughs> that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.